Hi, I'm Jim and this is Jim's Fix-It Shop. And we're going to do the shop tour. It's still pretty much a mess, but there's not much I can do about it. Because as soon as I'm done with this video, this machine's going in there and we're going to start tearing that apart. It does nothing. He said when he started cleaning up his yard this last week, it started and ran great. He came back out to finish up and it does nothing. The solenoid doesn't click, nothing. Brand new battery. Plus, when I was blowing it out to get all the stuff off the deck to get it in, I noticed two pretty good sized holes wore right through the deck. So we're gonna have to do some welding to it also. But this is the shop on the outside. I can move this, I'm gonna do this camera work myself, so bear with me. The shop is a pole barn style building and it is 28 by 40 feet long. It has a nine foot door and a 36 inch entrance door. This is how I get the machines in and out. I got planks that I put from the trailer in on the floor and I just roll them in. The lean-to where the furnace and all the wood used to be is 24 feet by 12 feet. And right now it's full of <laughs> yard sale stuff. We're having a big sale this summer and everything is going one way or another. The trailer, I've totally outgrown. I can only move one machine at a time. I had to go to Coopersville about a week and a half ago. I had to rent a trailer, or I thought I was going to rent a trailer because <clears throat> I had this one all tore apart to rebuild. And I, <coughs> I got the deck ripped off it, uh, all the wiring and the lights off it, and then I started adding things up and I said, you know what, it's too small anyway. I went out and bought a brand new one. That is a six foot wide instead of five, 10 feet long instead of eight. It has a ramp instead of being a tilt. I never did care much for that tilt thing, but it works. So this will probably be the last machine I haul on it now that I've got it all fixed up. If you can look in the front, you can see a bracket I built that bolts to the tongue and it has a winch on it. And then in front of the winch, you can see it has a roller. So when you have the, the trailer tipped up and you're pulling the, the machines up on the trailer, the weight of the machine on the strap helps pull the trailer down and latch into place. Really works great. <laughs> That's probably the first and only time I'll be able to use it. Let's go inside and uh, I'll try not to make you seasick. It's a sign my wife helped me design. She called, she came up with the gym's dream and pretty much has been. Now, a lot of talking and hollering and crying <laughs> went into the design and build of this building. Uh, my wife and me went back and forth on the size that I we were going to make it. I was just going to make it smaller. She said, no, you got to make it bigger. Yes, she said I had to make it bigger. I should have listened because I wish I would have made it a little, little bigger. But uh, she said, you got to make it at least as big as my dad's. And his is basically the same size with a lean-to but his is on the other side of the building. The lean-to stores my very large wood furnace 
and I mean very large, uh, it'll drive you right out of here in no time. And all the wood that I burned in a year, I stacked in that same room. Now it's full of stuff I want to get rid of. Um, a lot of guys I've noticed online collect stickers. This is a couple stickers that uh, Gorilla Gripper sent me for the grippers I have for carrying plywood. I don't collect stickers. I'm not into stickers. I'm into collecting friends. And this is what I've been calling it for a long time, my wall of friends, or my wall of shame, I used to call it, because there's nobody up there. Well, we have about 200 guys and women up there that fix machines and they have, I have helped them do it either through my videos or a lot of emails. I've got some guys and a couple of women that I bet we went back and forth 30 times before we got the issue solved. And if that's what it takes, that's what I'll do. Now, to go around the building, <clears throat> I don't know if I can raise this up a little to make it better. I don't know. Like I said, it's going to be bumpy because I got to do this myself. This is a table saw I bought a couple of years ago. It's a general. It's made in, it's a Canadian company. Extremely well built and beautiful machine. Uh, I keep it covered up because I don't want it to get damaged. My wife and granddaughters come out here and they do painting and that way they can just use that as a table. I don't have to worry about it. Uh, over here is, I've got a couple of six inch belt sanders. I gave this one to my father-in-law to use and it turned out he really liked one. So I found <clears throat> one of these craftsmen at a sale in Shipshawana, Indiana. I think the guy wanted a hundred bucks for it, so I bought that. It came with a stand, and I gave him that one, and I took my old one back. This is a very old one that you can tell by the base. That's probably back in the 50s. <coughs> I have a lot of old machines. I would trade a brand new one for an old one any day. They're just built better. They're built to last, let's face it. Uh, I do have a partner in my wood shop that helps me out quite frequently. His name is Dusty, and that's him right there. He's, uh, he's one of them silent partners that don't say a lot, which eh, works out for me. Over here is my storeroom I built. I just built a six by six room inside of this main room and that has all my supplies in it. Uh, it has all my paints, varnishes, uh, anything I didn't want to freeze. When I heated this place with wood and we went away for a week, I have, you can't see it, but down there against that wall, there's a four foot electric heater. And this is an insulated room with a steel insulated door. I can set the thermostat on 58, 60 degrees. It kept at that temperature no matter what this room was. I didn't have to worry about it. Well, now I got tired of cutting wood. I put in a gas furnace. <clears throat> but I still use the wood one, especially on the weekends when it's cold outside. I like it about 80. <laughs> No, it just gets there because I put too much wood in that thing. Uh, over here is a dust collector that I did online or on videos. I explained that. Uh, I do have another dethatcherizer for a snapper writer. That's for sale. In the back is a cardboard barrel full of golf clubs. I use them in my crafts. I build crafts with old golf clubs. I have a friend that goes to Florida every winter and he says, how many do you want? Because when you go down to Florida and you get all these guys that <clears throat> are so good at golf, he said they get around some guys that are better 
that have better clubs, he says they throw these things in goodwill and they go out and buy themselves a new set. He says you can pick up any golf club, regardless if they're woods, irons, anywhere from 25 to 50 cents a piece. So he always brings me back, I don't know, 30 or 40 of them every time he comes back from Florida. <clears throat> Over here in the corner behind the saw is all the stuff that I can't leave out in the old garage because it'll freeze. So that sits there until warm weather and then it gets out of here. Um, underneath the table saw, I have my steel leaf blower and my steel uh, sprayer. I, I like to keep stuff covered up in the, in the wood shop just to keep the dust out of the engines and electric motors. Back there hiding in the corner underneath the green blanket is my Simpson uh, power washer I got last year. Extremely nice machine. That is a industrial rental machine. That's what all the rental shops buy to rent out. It comes with a full 10 year warranty on the pump, lifetime on the frame, five years on the Honda engine. It's a extremely well built, nice working machine. This is my Excalibur scroll saw. You've seen that before. This is one of the new high speed saws but I have one over there in the corner that is probably from the 50s. <clears throat> and it is a, I sold one. I think that's a Rockwell Delta. The only difference with them and these, these are faster. Them are more accurate. On these machines, because of the way they're designed, and you can adjust most of it out, but not all of it. When the blade, goes up and down, it's doing this. It's tipping. Now that's a little exaggerated. That machine over there has a gearbox and the blades go perfectly straight up and down. They do not tilt at all. So if I'm cutting something thick and I want it to slide in and out, I have to use that old timer over there to get it to cut right. More shelves. The whole back of the shop is full of shelves with parts, templates, patterns, uh, you name it, it's up there. My chargers, the reindeer, <laughs> I can't remember who asked about that. <clears throat> I did a video on them. It's just a lot of stuff and it goes all the way let me tip this. It goes all the way to the ceiling, all the way across. It should be a little brighter in here. I just changed all the light bulbs last week. That was a fun job. I even cleaned the fixtures. Here's a bench here that I do most of my assembling on. I have a 12-foot a long bench over there I do a lot of assembling on. Um, this is my radio arm saw one of them and my pin router down there now when i'm not using them i keep them swung out of the way this bench here that i usually do work on is covered with all the parts for my 33 inch snapper over here that's on the table i got to take off to get that uh, john deere in here and there's a box of parts down there the seat is up here. This is a new seat. Well, newly refinished. It was pretty rusty and I took it down and I had it powder coated. Now, if you don't know much about powder coating, you cannot sandblast that stuff off. I mean, it's amazing. So I found this place that we send work to that does sandblasting. And I went over and talked to him. <clears throat> and he says, well, no, you can't just sandblast it off. He says, you got to bake it. And I said, what do you mean bake it? 
Oh, we got this big oven. We throw it in there and we crank it up to 800 degrees. Now, he didn't tell me how long it has to stay in there. Then when it comes out, it's powdered. He says you can almost blow it off. But we sandblast it because the grit of sand they use is very coarse and it makes the surface feel really rough. I mean, it feels like 100 grit sandpaper. But he says the powder sticks to it better. And when the powder melts, it's perfectly smooth, just like that seat. Now I had somebody ask me once, he says, now wait a minute, you got your radio arm saw out here. And I didn't have this up here, just the table. And he said, there's no cuts in your table. I said, well, I have an auxiliary table I put up there. And the main reason I have this is you got this set at zero and you've got this lined up where it goes through your fence in the back. Now, when you want to cut at a 45, you're cutting way off your table. Well, not if your table moves. You can slide this back down here so you're going through the same spot in your fence and you're still on the center of your table. So that's how I do that and I keep the bench nice. Now if I want to use this for assembling, I can take this off and put it up against the wall somewhere. And I got a nice flat surface on the whole 10 feet area. My radio arm saw. This, a guy, I went home one day from work and I drove past this guy's house and this bad boy was sitting out on the edge of the road next to his garbage cans. So I blew on the rest of the way home. It was only like four or five blocks and I grabbed my neighbor because he, they're buddies. I said, come on, Jim, we gotta go somewhere. So I went over and talked to this guy and he was moving. And I said, I got to ask, what are you going to do with that radio arm saw out there? Because it was on the metal legs. He said, well, we're going to load that in the back of your truck. So he gave it to me. He said, it doesn't run. Well, I do a lot of work with Jones Electric. And they have a motor shop. So I just took the stop out of the front. And I just slid this off, took the cord out took it down to the motor shop and I said, see what this is going to cost me to get it running. So he called me back about a day later and he said, we got it running. I said, well, I wanted a price. Don't worry about it. I ain't going to charge you. I said, well, what was wrong with it? This little guy right here. Capacitor was burned up. Now the standard capacitor was very small. That's why they didn't last long. And it was supposed to fit inside this little box. So it was out of sight. But this comes with a bracket and an end cap. Yeah, and all capacitors, you can get these end caps that cover up the wiring. And you snap it in this spring bracket and it just hangs there. This is the best saw I've ever had. Even comparing it to that brand new Craftsman. Love that saw. All I do with it is make 90 degree cuts. I have this set perfectly square. When I build cabinets, the cabinet sides, I rip the eight foot sheet in half, 24, 23, whatever I want. And I put the sheet up here and I cut halfway through. I flip it over and cut the other way through. And I have a perfectly straight cut that lines up and no sanding or belt sanding to try to get it flat. It does have an extension table on here. I use a lot because I did a lot of trim work for houses. Uh, this leg comes out. This half folds under, underneath this half, and the whole thing swings down and just hangs off of the tabletop. <coughs> You've all seen my model. Now, as in any small shop, you have to be able to move that chair, move stuff around, including this one. I have two of these.
they're six inch joiners. <clears throat> I've got a 12 inch planer underneath that bench. And this one is from the, uh, this one is probably in the 70s. That one down there, you can tell by looking at it, that's from the 50s. This one, when you plane a board or join an edge, it goes thump, 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 thump. It doesn't matter how hard you try to get them blades set with an indicator, it's still going to thump. You're not going to get them perfect. That one down there, the head comes out. That's why I like it. I took the work. We put new blades in it. Mike Sherwood used to work down there. First, we put the blades in, and he put a dog, that's what we call them, on the end of the arbor, center holes in each end, stuck it in a OD grinder, and we ground the blades all perfectly straight and in line with each other. Then he took it out of there, he put it in his um, cutter grinder with a finger that follows the blade, and he ground it off and back the edge off so it was sharp. We checked that with an indicator and all three blades, the entire length of the six inches, run within one half of a thousandth of an inch. When you run a board across that, there is no thumping. It's just a quiet, smooth hum as you're joining the board. I use this one for roughing it down so I only have to pass one or two passes with that one to flatten it out and give a perfectly square and flat edge. Now to move these things around, on my old bandsaw over there, <coughs> I have a couple boards underneath with casters on them. And there's a pedal sticking out. You step on that pedal, it shoves them two boards down and it shoves the casters down. And then you slide the pedal to the side. It's got like an L-shaped cut in the front, and it locks it there. Well, that's okay for a machine that don't weigh over 80, 85 pounds. You get one of these bad boys, especially that one down there with all that cast iron in it, and you're not going to do stepping on a pedal. They ain't cutting it. Two casters on the far end are on the floor all the time. The front is sitting on two rubber adjustable feet. You pull the handles out. And you can roll it around the room anywhere you want it, just like a wheelbarrow. Perfect design. It works flawlessly. <coughs> And you shove it in and get the handles out of the way. And they both have dust ports so you can suck out all them chips as you're roughing or finishing the board. Both of them are designed uh, the same way, same size box, the motors inside the box, so that helps it stay clean. <coughs> Getting a little dry. And uh, I don't have any problems with uh, chips getting in the belt or in the pulleys, or in the vents on the motors. Now we can go down here if I can get these legs of this tripod through this little skinny aisle. Down here is the engine. I don't know if you can see it because I can't tip you far enough. You can just barely see it. That's the 17 horse that goes on this 33 inch machine that's sitting on the table, which I have to take off and get that John Deere in here. I told my wife the only problem with putting this thing back together is right now it's easier to store because it's in pieces. I put this all back together, I gotta find a place to store it. So I may not put that together until I'm ready to sell it and get rid of it. This is a little, little cheap bandsaw I picked up for 50 bucks from a yard sale. It's Chinese 
Harbor Freight piece of crap, and that's about all it's worth, 50 bucks. But I worked on it for quite a while, and I actually got it where it works pretty nice. It, I can cut a four inch wide, half inch thick piece of flat stock the long way, and it comes out straight. Couldn't believe it. Uh, we'll go down through here. I got too much stuff. This is part of my steel um, weed whacker or power head. The, all the attachments are in there. I want to make a stand for them. But this is the this is the pedal I was talking about. I don't know if I can tip you down low enough to see that either. That's the pedal you step on to lift up the bandsaw. It just didn't work on them. It was way too heavy. <clears throat> More parts laying over here for the 33-inch uh, machine. There's the tires and the seat. I'm not going to use that seat. It's too ripped up. That's what I got that new one over there fixed up for was to put on this machine. This is a toolbox I used to have down at work. I've got pretty much anything in there you could need to work on just about anything. Here's the 1950-ish. I think they used to call these jigsaws back in the day. But uh, again, that works extremely nice. It's very square. And uh, I don't know if I'd ever sell that one. <clears throat> the top of the toolbox has got stuff on I'm trying to put away. I got all these plastic bins. And I got all my extra parts that I want to get out of the bags they come in and in these drawers so I can find what I need a little easier. Uh, I do have some woodworking stuff on this side of the shop. I can't help it. can't get it all over there. This is a 18 by 36 thickness sander. This is uh, this saves me a lot of work when I'm sanding panels. It's got a support over here I put on because it had, um, when I run oak through here, like 16 inch pieces of oak, it has a little bit of deflection in this arm. This just hangs out here open normally, which isn't that bad. But the closer you can keep something, a whole lot easier it is to build something. So I put this, I made this bracket and put it on here. But it two bolts here and one bolt down here, and this arm comes off. This part stays on, and then you can do a 36 inch wide board by running it through one direction, spinning it around, and running the other side through. <coughs> Um, I had about a 1970 wood lathe and I got the opportunity to buy this one. This is again back in the 50s. All cast iron. Nice machine. So I sold, actually I gave the um, wood lathe to one of the guys I work with at the shop. And I bought this one. Now this is something that I've never seen before on a snapper. This is on the 33 inch with a clamshell bagger on the back. Apparently when they get full, they're heavy. <coughs> he orders this thing brand new. So apparently they build some of these for the clamshells. Inside of here is a block of steel. And that is welded in there. And it's painted over. There's no burn marks on the outside. And there's no burn marks on the inside. That piece of steel was added at the factory for a counterweight for that bagger. Plus, on the front of this face where it says snapper, 
the plates are over there. There's six, there's either six or eight quarter inch thick plates, all about 14 inches long and about six or seven inches wide. And I weighed all them up. That's another 50 some pounds plus this hunk of iron in here just to offset <coughs> just to offset that bagger. Now I've been trying to get some of my tools out here and put up. Uh, I do have my impact sockets out here. I put some shelves in that are full of little bins for parts. I have my uh, ultrasonic cleaner here and my Lincoln welder is under here. Again, I like to keep stuff covered up to keep the dust out of it, especially anything with electronics. Now we're over in this corner of the room. Um, again, we, I have this covered up. This is more or less the wife's area. She does a lot of jewelry work. We don't necessarily always build it from scratch. <clears throat> Sometimes we buy jewelry that she likes and she changes it to make it more her. We just take this off. Roll this up. And that's all the beads and uh, catches and eyelets. And, oh, it's just too much to mention. <laughs> That's all of her tools. I made her one of these for holding parts when she's trying to assemble it. Um, filing, a couple filing cabinets are the actual legs to this old bench I repurposed. I built a back to have uh, shelves and pigeonholes uh, to put her stuff in. And then this part, here is the door that I come in and out of. <clears throat> I just last week got these ladders out of here. They used to set <clears throat> on top of the rails going across. The door is only nine feet wide. And I have a 12 foot, a 10 foot, and an 8 foot, and a 6 foot step ladder. I put the two long ones across and the two shorter ones on top. Well, every time I wanted to open this door and bring something in or out, I had to take them ladders down. So we changed them. We put a shelf up there that the ends sit on. You can kind of see the shelf. And this end sits on a 2x4 that goes from rail to rail. It's still a job to get them up there. And what I'm going to go get is some of these rope and pulleys that you hang bicycles with to the ceiling of your garage. And I'm going to get like eh, probably three of those so I can just put that end on the shelf and lift this end up with that pulley system because that 12 footer is some days it's more than I want to deal with. <coughs> Here's a... Uh, Drill press I bought back in the probably late 70s. I looked and looked for a drill press made in the USA. I always try to find stuff made in the USA. <coughs> this wasn't, was, was and wasn't. <coughs> Sorry. This was casted in Taiwan, which is a whole lot better than China. It was, see, how did that work? It was casted in Taiwan. It was machined in, oh, Minnesota, a, a, a state where they used to build them. Now they just machine it. They do all the boring for the spindle and the 
the column in the back and the mounts for the motor. All the machining is done in the U.S. It's got more miles on it than my car. Then it goes to Mexico for assembling. Well, I figured this is the best I can come up with because at least the machine work is done in a country that knows what they're doing. <coughs> Another toolbox. This is a, a box I used to have at the shop, and that's a rollaway I bought for it. And I brought it home when I inherited all my brother-in-law's tools after he passed. He was a tool and die. And I just don't know what I'm going to do all this stuff. When I retire, uh, there is so much stuff online for sale. I don't know how I'm going to get rid of it. <clears throat> um, there's a guy up in Burley Park, I think they call it. I used to go up there all the time, and he I think he buys everything from somebody retiring, and he splits it all up, and he sells it. I think I'm going to go have a talk with him when it opens up this year. Now, here's a cabinet I made for storing. Well, I've got my Lee jig up here for dovetails and the router. This is a pocket hole from Craig. That's my grinder, my spindle sander, and my mortising machine. Now it may look like this stuff is sitting on a shelf, but it's not. These shelves all come out. The item is bolted to it. If I want to, well I got a big, I got my uh, pocket hole jig here and a small dovetail jig back there I got before this one that's for sale but this stuff is made so you can pull it out set it on the workbench and this board goes in the vise so it's sitting on a flat surface and it's mounted solid with the vise all these are the same way. The grinder, the vise in the back, the spindle sander, they all have that board on the bottom. I can set them on my bench and tighten the vise up. This big bench in the front also has a wood vise. I bought them from a school along with this really nice shaper. That's back from the 50s. So if I didn't have this box of wood in front of it, you could see the foot or the base looks identical to the belt sander. Back in the 50s, they put that same base on all their machines. The band or the uh, the drill press has that same base on it. <clears throat> I got a spare one over there next to the saw. You can see that right, right, where is it? Right there. That base I'm going to use for my belt sander when I get that built. Then we're back over here to this workbench. Now behind me, I have, or behind you, I have a Delta 14 inch bandsaw steel base, one horse motor. <coughs> it has the riser block. So I have 12 inches of distance in here. And I've been slabbing off some boards off this piece of Osage orange, uh, just to see if the wood was any good. It looks pretty bad on the outside, but the boards are actually aren't too bad. There is some cracking in it, but I can work around the cracks. Wiggle you over here. Sorry about this camera work, but like I said, I've always do this by myself. Um, we got a bunch of <coughs> bunch of drawers here. I have all my nails for my nailer, uh, screws for the Craig fixture. Um, I have all different sizes of drywall screws over here. I have other parts down here that uh, are for clock guts. I make a lot of clocks. 
and uh, my tapping head. This works phenomenal. Uh, I tried to do a video on it once, but that fixture over there, or that angle iron frame on the bottom of that rollaway is separate. You can buy them from the company if you're going to have a lot of weight in that box, along with the other two on top of it, they recommend you buy that angle iron frame that supports the casters. Then the bottom box slides into that frame. Without that on there, you could have one of the casters fold under and this whole thing would tip over. <coughs> it's not cheap. It came with the box when I bought it, and the holes were stripping out for some reason. And there's four holes in each caster. So that's 16 holes. I drilled them out to a half inch 13. And I put the tap in this thing and put the frame down here. You can literally tap them holes as fast as you can crank this without stopping. All the way in, all the way out. Actually, that's a Chinese machine. Okay, I can't find one made in the U.S. But it, I checked it and it is completely square, which I was amazed. And I bought the shop one. We use it down there almost daily for tapping stuff because it just, it works so easy and so quick. <clears throat> and you're hardly ever going to break a tap because most taps break when you're trying to turn them. You bend them and that snaps them right off. This thing keeps them completely square. Works great. Underneath this bench, I have two Craftsman workbenches just for the drawer space. Over here underneath the pin router and a radio arm saw, I have two more benches for storage. Underneath the lathe on the other side of this divider that's in the room, um, I have another Craftsman bench <coughs> for storage, a lot of lathe tools, face plates, uh, work dress, or the uh, tool support is in them drawers. Uh, let's see, let's go back over here by the above the storage room is my storage for my clamps. Now you've seen these things, I made these. 35, 38 years ago. And now everybody's making them like, wow, this is something we just came up with. A lot of this stuff's been around for years. It's just that they've seen them somewhere and they start making them. On the back of my door, I even have, I have pictures over here because I ran out of room here until I took my pegboard down and put it on the door. You all have heard of all these guys making floating shelves. Well, again, I made these about 30 years ago. And it's simple. You take a 1 8 inch or a 3 16 inch drill bit. You drill two holes in the shelf that lines up with the pegboard holes. And you just use pegboard hooks and stick them in the hole. Pretty simple. You can move them around anywhere you want them. I've got quite a few of them in the shop on, on pegboards. But that's about it. I hope I didn't go too fast. Again, here's the parts for my snapper. Old ones, all the new ones. This 12 horse engine I wanted to rebuild, but I got a hold of my parts guy in Whitehall and he says, we can't get parts for that engine anymore. Cannot get piston rings. <clears throat> the only thing I can get you is a 10,000 oversized rings on the piston. 
I said, I don't know if I want to go to work of having this board. So I called the guy back and I got a hold of one of the of the mechanic or the assistant mechanic out there. And he said, what do you mean? I can get you piston rings for that. And he says, he gave me the, he gave me the part numbers. So he didn't have to look them up again. So as soon as I get some of these other jobs done, I want to try to throw my hand at rebuilding this engine. Uh, by the looks of it, it's going to need a exhaust valve. This is just full of oil and of course rings. <coughs> now I checked the compression on this with a standard compression gauge and I got about 50 pounds, which it did run. <coughs> but I checked the uh, rings and valves with a leak down tester. That's what you really want to use because it tells you everything. You screw that thing in there. You, see, you can use the same hose that comes with your um, compression tester. <coughs> you have two gauges on this thing. You plug your air hose in. You bring your piston up to top dead center with volt valves closed. You slowly crank the pressure up on this thing to 100 PSI. Now the first gauge will tell you how much air you're pushing into the engine. The second gauge tells you how much pressure the engine is holding against the valves and the piston rings. They say 10% is allowable. They says that's typical. Anything more than 10% you have a problem. <laughs> well, I could hear air coming out of the exhaust, because when you put your finger in there, it would change tones. I could even hear that. And I had a lot of air blowing out of this crankcase vent that's supposed to plug into the carburetor. So I wanted to see if it would change any noise coming out of the valve if I covered that up. Now this air was coming from the rings. So I plugged this hole up. And then, I don't know if you can see it, it's behind the stud here, the fill valve for the oil. That started doing this. Literally, I'm not kidding. It started blowing this thing up in the air and oil started coming out. That's how bad the rings are leaking. So if I can get, I got to tear it down to see if the exhaust valve is lappable because they cannot get a valve for it. And if I can salvage the valve, I'll get rings and uh, maybe even a new piston, I don't know. I don't know what's actually wrong with it until I completely tear it apart and clean it. We'll see what the uh, connecting rod looks like on the crank, if it's got a lot of slop or wear, and maybe putting a rod in it too. Like I said, you, you just can't tell what's wrong with some of this equipment until you tear it apart. I've got a machine sitting down here that a viewer wanted me to repair. He brought it over here. We got it in, the, I got it in the shop. I tore it all apart and there was so much stuff wrong with it. I think we're just going to put a few things in it, like maybe fender bearings, bushings and uh, a couple of bearings, the needle bearings in the chain case and just put it back together. It's kind of a family heirloom. He wants to keep it, but he wanted it powder coated and completely rebuilt <clears throat> and without any labor, which God knows I never charge anything anyway. <laughs> he was looking at about eight to nine hundred dollars just for parts Powder coating was 300 bucks on its own because there's a lot of pieces. When you tear one of these completely apart, more deck and everything, there's a lot of pieces that all have to be sandblasted and powder coated. And I don't know how many of you guys actually understand how the process of powder coating is, 
but the company that did my seat is going to let me come in and videotape the process from start to finish on powder coating. I think he said he wants to wait till he gets some plow blades in. He says, because that's a brighter color. He says, black, we do everything in black. He says, let me get something that's colorful and looks a little cooler than black. So as soon as he gets a hold of me, I'm going to take a day off and I'm going to spend it down there going through this entire process of powder coating an item, which there's a lot to it. So I guess that's it. That's, uh, that's the whole place in a nutshell. So uh, I hope I haven't bored you to death. Good grief, we got 50 minutes on this thing. And uh, until next time, work safe, have fun, and keep on snapping. We'll talk to you soon. So long.